Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Eastridge High School and our welcome back for staff for the 2016-17 school year. Please join me in our band directors, Brett Como from Eastridge, Tom Storm from Park High School, and Tart Katzenmeyer from Woodbury High School as our marching bands from the summer perform for you this morning.
big thank you to the marching band. Let's give them one more round of applause. Way to go, guys. Thank you again to our marching band directors, Brett Como from Eastridge, Tom Storm from Park, and Tart Katzenmeyer from Woodbury. Great job. At this time, we'd like to introduce school board chair Ron Cap. Well, hey, good morning, everyone. I am Ron Kath with the school board, and I know I was talking to the band directors as this event was started, and I said, nobody came here to listen to me. I said, can the band play while I'm talking? They'll probably enjoy that a heck of a lot more. <laughs> but in all sincerity, today is about you guys. It's not about a school board. It's not about anything else, it's about our staff and how we bring that together. I do want to introduce a few of my colleagues from the school board that are with us today. Sharon Van Leer is here, Katie McAway Stevens, and for the school board members that were not able to attend, that was Tracy Burnett, Joe Slavin, and Katie Schwartz. What's interesting to me is I wish I could start my fiscal year at the company I work for with a marching band. What a way to get some enthusiasm to start a year. Let's give the band one more round of applause as they exit. I've gotten the privilege to be on this school board for 13 years and live in this community for over 20. And the enthusiasm that I see today will only build on what we started. Think about what we've all started. The integration of Valley Crossing. All the design thinking that I've been hearing about. Think about what we've done just from our bus mechanics. For those that don't know, four years of perfect inspection scores, that's unheard of. Think about what we've done from the one-to-one -one initiative. You guys have been all part of that to make it work. Are we perfect? No. We'll look forward to those continued new ideas to le leverage that and help kids to get to that critical thinking. And last but not least, I want to thank all of you and especially our nutritious services. Think about those healthy lunches and programs that they put on to make sure our kids are in a good environment and they're thinking properly to help us as we go forward. So a lot to be thankful for, a lot to look forward to as we move forward into a new school year. Because the one thing, for those that have been with this district a long time, thank you. Thank you for your service. And for those that are new to our district, please raise your hands. Thank you for choosing our district. I know you all have choices. And to choose this district, I'm selfish, because I think we got the best damn district in the state of Minnesota, and it's because of you guys. And where does that come together? For those that have been with us, the story I always tell, and you can tell, I'm the biggest cheerleader for this district. And the privilege as a school board member that we get every June, 1,700 kids receive diplomas. And I can tell you the expression in their faces, in the families, in the pride, doesn't happen without great staff. 
So again, give yourself a round of applause. We're excited to kick this year off. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our superintendent, Dr. Chief D Keith Jacobus, to start our school year. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I wish they would have left the uh, podium here so you might see me. I want to welcome you to the school year, and as Ron Cass said, welcome our new employees, and thank you also for choosing to come to the South Washington County School District. This is a little odd because I'm hearing my voice, and then it comes back a second later. So. I want to thank our combined marching band. They are now off to the state fair to represent us in front of a uh, cast of millions. And we are fortunate this year to welcome a new school into our district. It was a little unique. We didn't build a new school. We were fortunate to, with our partnership, then take the building over. That doesn't sound good to welcome the building, and I want to uh, welcome Valley Crossing again, and thank you. So we have a lot to look forward to in our future, and I want us to think about the fact that the future doesn't just happen. We design our own our future. We create our own culture and climate, based on the way we think and the way we perceive our work and working with the kids in our school district. And so we, as we look to innovate and change, we need to think about how do we do that and how do we best design the future that we want. Jane McGonagall is a cognitive scientist who works with game developers to help them problem solve and think about good decision making as they design games. But she also works with organizations who are looking to improve and looking toward the future. And she works with them based on how our brain works and how we start to look forward to be better problem solvers and to design the future that we want. And she talks about three things in her research. One it she talks about is remembering the future. The second one is predicting the past. And the third one is hard empathy. And those three concepts she calls counterfactual memory. And if we think about the future, remembering the future, what she describes in her research, and as they scan people and watch their brains work, when they think about what the future could be like, and the more detail that we think about and consider as far as wanting to move forward, the, the greater the chance that we will realize that future, and the greater chance that we'll make the right decisions to get to where we want to go. So she works with organizations and she works with kids to try to remember by really going through what would the future look like. And the more you do that, the better you get at problem solving. The other thing that they realize is that you have a burst of creativity as you go through that thought process. So if you're trying to solve problems, it's a great, not just an exercise, but a, a really important way to train our minds to work. And I think it's beneficial for us as we look to the future and also for our kids. When she talks about predicting the past, she talks about asking people to look at past events in your life and to think about if you would have made a different decision, what would that have meant to you? If you would have chosen not to accept your position here in the South Washington County School District, what might your life be like? If you had chosen not to meet, or whatever we did to meet certain people, what would our life be like? When they work with kids and with people, they see the same thing that happens as you go through that thought process. 
you have a burst of creativity, you also realize that your choices matter and that you have a lot more control over what the future will look like. For some of our kids that are struggling with depression and some of the difficult things that are happening in their lives, many times they feel like life just happens. And if we can help them by looking at how their choices affect them, and I know we do that when, when we're trying to correct behavior and things like that, but more in, in, a, in a futuristic look of how their life can be shaped is important. And the last thing is hard empathy. Empathy is not just a feeling. We have to work at being empathetic. And it, empathy works on a type of neuron in your brain called, or works because of, mirror neurons. And some of us have a more robust mirror neuron system and we have greater empathy. But we all can get better. And what she means by hard empathy is to really look at empathizing with people who think differently than you and think completely in a way you can't understand or you can't agree with. Also, to think about and empathize about people's lives who have a, a different life than we have and we may not even be able to relate. I think this is the key for us as we look at personalizing education for kids, that idea of working on hard empathy sometimes when our kids may be doing things that we wish they were not. So over the last school year, we worked to gather information from stakeholders, students, staff, parents, and community members to redesign and redevelop the next rendition of our strategic plan. And as we looked at our plan, we focused on two objectives. Now our mission remains the same, to ignite a passion for lifelong learning, but we also examined our core values and brought to the forefront or the priority five core values that we want to think about as we, we move into our work this year. The first one in, in not priority order is collaboration. We cannot be as successful individually as we can be together. That collective wisdom helping us move forward is very important and that's why we set up uh, uh, professional learning um, <laughs> committees and, and other ways that our departments can collaborate so we can work together. Continuous improvement is a second core value. This summer we had a great example watching the Olympics of regardless of where we are, we can always get better. And if you look at the athletes in the Olympics, every four years it's amazing how much faster they've gotten, how much more difficult the tricks and the different things that they do in the different events such as uh, gymnastics and diving. And those athletes are never satisfied. Intellectually, we have examples of in the arts, in writing and in song and in, in production of trying to always get better. And that's a, a core value that I think is important for us as we move forward. The third one is equity. If you remember last year, I, I spoke to you about equality and equity. That equality presents opportunities for all kids and there's a possibility that they may be successful. But when we focused on equity, it, it gives every student what they need and it increases the probability. And so we want to make sure we're leading with our policies, our procedures, and what we do to create that equitable situation for all kids. The fourth one is integrity, doing what's right, when no one knows whether you've done it right or not. And I think that you exemplify that as, as we go through um, the year and in the interactions that I've had and the problems that we've solved together. And the final one uh, is relationships. And that we need to create that positive environment and positive relationships so you can thrive as employees in the school district and then our kids can thrive. So we have two objectives that will move us forward over the next number of years. The first is personalized learning. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how I hope that we are going to move forward differently than other school districts 
that term personalized learning is something that's very common in the lit literature and a number of districts are looking at personalizing the educational experience. I think we have the potential in our school district to do it in an unparalleled way and move our kids forward. The second objective is on our climate culture, not only for our students, but also for our and employees, and I'll, I want to talk briefly about that as well. So how will we personalize? The one thing I want us to embrace and think about again, which you've heard this term over and over probably over the years, is in loco parentis, which is Latin, meaning in the place of parents. When the educational system in our country was developed, in loco parentis gave us the direction on what society hoped that we would do as educators. We'd be in the place of parents. We would educate kids as they came in, as if we were their parents. And I would like us to think about every student and treat every student and make decisions with every student as if they were our own personal children. If you drive a bus and you had a bus load of your own kids, would you do the same things that you do now? I think most of us would. Almost all of us would, but sometimes we have to think about that. And if we have our own children and we send them off to an educational system, we want the adults that work with them to treat them as if they were their parents as well. Because we hold our own kids to the highest level of accountability, but we work with them to personalize what needs that they have. If you have more than one child, you know that they present to you an emotional system or a way of thinking, strengths and weaknesses, challenges and joys that are different from each one of your children but you personalize without even thinking about it. And I believe that that's where our potential lies in our school district. The other aspect is that concept of hard empathy. When kids come into our buses, when they come into our classrooms, they come into the cafeteria, or they're walking down our hallways, they don't leave their life behind. Just as you don't leave your life behind and we don't know what they're struggling with. They might have gotten up that morning and not had anything to eat. Their family might have been disintegrating for a number of reasons. They might be suffering with health issues or a loved one. The same thing that we go through. And we don't know what our colleagues are bringing with them every day when they come to work. And that hard empathy, sometimes when kids are misbehaving, and doing things we wish they wouldn't do, we really have to work on the hard empathy. Tim Hoffman, who is a new assistant principal at Cottage Grove uh, Middle School, and he was in our district. Welcome, Tim. I stopped into it at an administrative meeting earlier in the summer, and Tim was talking about what behavior means. When kids are behaving a certain way, they're telling us something. They're giving us uh, some information. Not just that they want to make us mad. And I think that hard empathy, sometimes with our kids that are not fitting in, there's a reason for that behavior. And I think that's one of the ways that we can take a look at helping kids. Along with different strategies if they're struggling with our content. The other aspect is choice. The more that we can give people, out of all ages, choice, the more that they become engaged, they become motivated, and they work to do their best. We need to look at systems that give kids more choice and more voice. Yesterday I was talking to Gordy Den, and Gordy has developed our, um, one of our first blended courses, blended um, education. And what greater choice than to have a blended class where kids choose when they want to engage in the work? There's certainly things that have to get done, but they can work 24 hours a day anytime they want. We also want to give choice on the type of classes that they have a chance and electives, along with how they demonstrate their learning. And then the last thing is working on helping kids create meaning. 
We do not learn anything unless we can create meaning with the content. And you have to create your own meaning. If you understand something, that's not true learning. If any of you have done your own taxes, you probably understand how to complete the tax forms. But I don't think many of us who do our own taxes would say that we're an expert in tax law and tax preparation. There isn't a meaning for us other than just getting that work done. If we're creating systems for kids that have no meaning, they won't progress and they won't learn. The same thing with us as adults. So the second objective is climate and culture. And how do we develop that for ourselves? Barry Schwartz is a writer and he just wrote a book that is titled What We Think About Work Is Wrong. And he explains that we develop as humans, we develop our, our own human nature by the way we think. And organizations shape us to behave in a certain way. And he explains that in the early part of the Industrial Re Revolution, um, uh, one of the early industrialists, Adam Smith, who designed the assembly line and mass production, after the, he got started, his thinking was that humans were only motivated by external things. And so it didn't matter what the work they did, if you had the right external motivation. Now that idea is wrong, because we don't thrive unless there's meaning, but he explained that after a while, the people who worked on assembly lines, his quote, and I don't want to misquote him, is that these people generally become as stupid as it is possible for a human to become. He understood that that mind-numbing assembly line created people that became mind-numbed. And from there, Barry Schwartz has developed and looked at the research from anthropologists on how we develop our own cultures and, and our own institutions. If we create a climate and culture that's positive, that pushes us intellectually, then we will thrive. So our culture and climate, it is all up to us. If you look around, there may be folks that might not be as happy as we wish. We have to work that that culture and climate lifts people up. This morning there was a story about a, a journalist in the UK who wrote an article about optimism. And he talks about in times of difficult times that optimism isn't an option, it's really a requirement. And if we think optimistically, and we think about remembering the future, as Jane McGonigal says, we can control our culture, and we can develop the way our culture shapes us. So I'd ask you to think about what culture do you want in our school district as you leave today. So, we've been fortunate to have a number of students with us, and we have a couple students now that I'd like to introduce you to you that have had some great success over the last school year. So the first two are middle school students, Roger Altman and Ryder Sikowich. If I could have you guys come up. And I want you to know, this is intimidating for them, but I told them to watch all the mistakes I make and how difficult, and I know they're gonna do a great job. These guys are from Woodbury Middle School, and they've been woo, state winners in the National History Day, and then national contestants, and I believe you finished third place in the nation. And I'd like to ask them first, to explain to us, their project was called Andrew Jackson and the Bank War. And I read their research and it was very impressive. And I'd like to ask them to tell you what this project meant to them. And, and I, I also want to tell you they're in Alisa, uh, Alicia Bagley's class, Alyssa Bagley's class, and I've had a chance to be in her class. And every time I walk out, I want to read some history. 
So she has that ability to personalize and engage and move us forward, and I think these great scholars are examples. So first, if you tell us what the project meant to you, and then I'm gonna ask you to give us some advice. As we start the new school year, what would help us do the very best for you as a student? Um, well, at first, uh, I just thought, wait, I just thought that um, it was just a project, but then later, now that I look back at it, um, now it looks like more of a lesson because it taught me that, um, it taught me that working hard is good because it always gives you an award. <laughs> well, not always, but for me it did, and I'm lucky to have it. I, I thought and eat. Test this up. Okay, here. Maybe it's over. There. I thought it gave me a chance to compete against. No, I, I thought it gave me a chance to compete with people from around the, glo the globe. What advice you give us as we start the school year? So, um, some advice that I'd give teachers are um, to support their students because that's how I work the best. Longer lunches. Uh, thanks a lot, guys. Congratulations. Great work. I think all of us would agree with... <laughs> ...the impressive work that these gentlemen did and how difficult it is to stand in front as a middle school student. When I went to college, my first speech class was a disaster because I couldn't give the speech. And I had an older professor who called me in his office and put his arm around me and said, we'll get you through this. I don't even know how I ended up in teaching. But thank you. Thank you so much for the work that you've done and being here today. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce from Woodbury High School, Jocelyn and Jared Kaganin. Jocelyn and Jared were selected to represent our school system at the National AVID Conference this summer. So they had a chance as student leaders to talk to educators from around the nation about the AVID strategies that has helped them and what this has meant to them as far as their leadership and academic development. So first I'd ask, Jocelyn, if you could talk to us about the experience at the National Conference and what it meant to you. First off, I'd like to say without AVID, I didn't think I'd be as confident I am now to talk to all of you, but I've had the chance to talk to about 20 teachers every day plus more, never talked to this kind of big of crowd. <laughs> um, but the experience I've had, it was more than just talking to teachers. It was a family and I was nervous at first, but I found friends and to be honest, at first, I thought teachers were kind of scary. <laughs> not, 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 now I don't, but it gave me more confidence in myself than I thought I would ever have. And I've had to, ex I got to experience, um, to listen to other AVID students and the difficulty that they've had before they found AVID 
and the success they've had now. And Jared, would you just explain the AVID strategies that have helped you the most and that you shared at the national conference that was most meaningful for you? Um, for all my teachers out there, they know for sure that I am the most disorganized person in the world. To all my teachers out there, I still a little bit am, a little bit, but probably AVID has helped me the most with Cornell notes because I have questions every single day in my classrooms and I probably never get to ask them. So in the left column on the side, I have Cornell notes. I always write down five to eight questions that I have and at the end of the class, I would ask my teachers, what, what is this? I wasn't really paying attention, probably. But I would say, how does this subject help me in real life or what can I do to probably improve on my knowledge about the subject? And I'd like to give you both a chance to give us advice as we go into the school year and, and moving forward. Um, probably I would like to say is, all you guys have probably said this, but every one of your students are unique. I also think that, but I also think all of you are unique. Yeah. Every one of you has a unique way of teaching students, which has helped me get through elementary to middle school and to high school. And I would like you guys to push forward in yourselves and let your students know that you are unique. Uh, as I said before, as scary as it is that us students may see you, I think it's best to have that friendship with your student because nothing feels better than to feel welcome instead of being scared every time you're in the classroom. But yeah, having that relationship with your student makes us more feel comfortable, makes us more confident to strive to be successful. So we have two more students that have distinguished themselves at the national level. Alicia Zhang and Trey Edgerton are from Eastridge High School and have placed in the national speech tournaments. And I'd like those, Alicia and Trey to come up. So we had the fortune to hear um, their speeches and, and a little bit of description of their events at a board meeting, and it was very impressive as all of the students heard how they made it to this level. So Alicia, I'd like you to, to talk about, she placed 11th in the nation in extra, extemporaneous speaking, which I did not. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I wanted her to talk about, she's heard a lot about personalized learning and how to approach education. What advice she'd give us and what her educational career has meant to her and what has been most helpful. Thank you. 
So in any extemporaneous speaking speech, there are three main points. So today, um, the three things that I think have been more impactful in my learning and can be the same for every student or every teacher are a focus on improving creativity, understanding the material, and building relationships with students. So first, when all of us enter elementary school, we're all much more creative, and unfortunately that happens to fade as we go through the school system and age. But for me personally, the classes that I find most entertaining and more educational are the ones that focus on projects, on labs, or on self-driven inquiry that make me more inspired to learn and also helps boost students' creativity. Joe Bowler from Stanford University states that project-based learning can improve creativity as well as student achievement when compared to traditional schools. And this type of project-based learning can be implemented into a variety of curriculums and can make students more creative as well as inspire them to learn more. But Second, one of the major goals of education is to, of course, make sure that students retain the information. But, I mean, for me personally, over the summer, sometimes I forget how to count or write. But don't worry, AP Lit teachers, that summer homework will ensure that I can read by next Tuesday. However, to avoid this type of false understanding and losing the information that we learn, James Peplum from the ASCD suggests having test questions that are more varied, as well as focused on open-ended questions and to ensure that students fully understand and can utilize the information that they're taught instead of simply repeating a narrow set of facts. Finally, in the over 40 teachers that I've been fortunate enough to have here at District 833, every single one of them has been unique and wonderful in their own way. However, the ones that I remember the most even decades later are the ones that have taken the time to truly understand me as a student as well as a person. Academically, this can help in tailoring learning curriculums, but also outside of academia, I've been fortunate enough to have teachers who have acted as amazing advisors, as mentors, or even as friends who I can joke around with or rely on when I'm struggling. And this experience is incredibly important to me and something that I hope every student can experience because it truly makes a difference. So generally at the end of an accept speech, we end and begin with the same running joke, but I didn't start with a joke. So uh, I'll just end with a really cheesy joke. Why did the teacher wear sunglasses to school? Because her students were so bright. <laughs> All right, thank you. Well, as you can see, we need a lot of thick sunglasses and dark glasses. Thank you so much. And you have also qualified already for next year's national tournament based on your performances last year, correct? Congratulations. <laughs> Trey Edgerton will close our ceremony, but Trey has distinguished himself in poetry. He plays fourth in the nation in poetry. And I asked Trey to start with a poem that's particularly meaningful to him, and then to explain why he chose this poem. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plains seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream that dreamers dreamed. Let it be the great strong land of love where neither kings can nigh nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by the one above. America never was America to me. Let America be, may, be the liberty where it can be crowned with no false patriotic leap. 
but opportunity is real and life is free. Inequality and equity is in the air that we breathe. But there's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And you, that straws your fails across the stars? I am the poor white fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery's arm. I am the red man driven from the lamb. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. Finding the same old stupid plan of doggy dog, of mighty crush the weak. Sure. Call me any ugly name you choose. The seal of freedom does not stay. And for those who live like leeches on people's lives, we must take back our land again, America. Oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America, will be. Thank you very much. The reason I chose that poem is with all the adver adversary that has been going on the past few years, as far as the differentiation in races and, and genders, we must come together at one. All the teachers and all the students and all the, all the administration and, and everybody needs to come together as one district aiming towards one goal. And that's to educate our youth. Amen. Can I get an amen? <laughs> because think about it. The youth is the future. And if we have no education for the youth, then we have no future. And without future, the world is lost. But see, the thing about every single one of you is that you hold that light within you. You guys have the power to create our future. I don't think you heard that. Each single one of you, you have the power to create the future. My father still talks about his fifth grade teacher being one of the most influential people in his life. This man is in his 40s. And he's talking about someone that happened 30 years ago. I wasn't even a thought yet. That's how much power you guys have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Trey, and thanks to everyone who was part of the ceremony today, or the event, I should say. We can be very proud of the work that we've done in the future that we're creating as exemplified by our students today. Thank you. And I'm gonna ask Trey to close us out with a request to you as we finish the morning. Every single one of you, are you willing to give your best for me as one of the 18,000 students that you have? Are you willing to give your best for all of us the whole year? 
If every single one of you are willing to make that sacrifice and that dedication, I want you to come onto the field right now. Yeah, I'm calling you out. I want every single one of you to come onto the field right now. I'm patient. I know it's hard to get down as you come down to show your commitments to these students and all of our students. We want to end with a song from Cheers that signifies and tells us about where we want to be, where everyone knows our name. <laughs>